Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BSF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. here with realagriculture.com. I am back here today with another Canola School episode and I have here with me James Tanzi, who's the Provincial Insect Pest Management for the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture. How is it going today? Very good. That's awesome. So we are here, we're getting to the time of the year. Uh, Canola's starting to get into the ground across the prairie slowly. Maybe not quite yet, but we're almost <laughs> almost at that point. And one of the first insects we start really thinking about and can be really detrimental are those flea beetles. Um, what, what sorts of things should producers be thinking about right now? Uh, a couple of different things. Uh, uh, we have two uh, important species of flea beetles for, as far as canola and mustard growers go. Uh, so uh, we uh, both are in the genus Philatrida. Uh, one is Philatrida striolata, that is the striped flea beetle, and the other one is Cruciferae, the, cruci uh, the crucifer flea beetle. Uh, the feeding is 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 uh, indistinguishable, but the the striped flea beetle comes up uh, earlier. So I've got reports uh, that are about two weeks old now from the uh, uh, Saskatoon area that striped flea beetle is already up and active. And I've been looking around the Regina area. I still haven't seen crucifer flea beetle, uh, or, or heard any reports from uh, about crucifer flea beetle. Uh, the, the distributions within the province are different for the two different species. Uh, so northern regions are, are dominated by striped flea beetles, uh, and their range is apparently expanding. And there's there's a couple of potential different reasons for that that I can get into later if, if people are, are interesting, interested. Uh, Christopher flea beetle is still dominant in the south, so that is the Regina area. But once again, the damage is indistinguishable. Uh, uh, an important consideration, and, and I did allude to this earlier, is that striped flea beetle does come up earlier. Uh, so they're, it sounds like around the Saskatoon area, they're, they're ready to go waiting for those seedlings to come up. So what's the reason for that? Is that uh, due to, do they prefer dry conditions or how does that play into it? Uh, Straight flea beetle likes it a little bit cooler and a little bit moister. Uh, so that's why it's, it's typically northern distribution. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's just the, just the nature of the beasts as it, as it were. There, there are differences in there in their uh, in their uh, in their biologies and one one of those is is a longer overwintering period for for striped flea beetle so or for, or for, sorry for crisper flea beetle uh, yeah, the crisper flea beetle comes up later okay and between the two what what is obviously like you said the feeding isn't really all that different you can't tell but does the damage later on does it become more detrimental with one or the other yeah there, there are some who, who actually feel that striped flea, flea beetle can cause a little bit more damage uh, and there's also uh, some anecdotal evidence that they, that uh, they they tend to hunker down uh, when things are are cool and wet and can uh, uh, feed on the stems, which can cause uh, a fair bit of damage and and uh, and uh, uh, is uh, it makes rating difficult as far as uh, as far as uh, determining uh, uh, action thresholds. Uh, but of course, if a seedling is cut off at the stem, I mean that seedling is done. You know, with, with a few bites. And, and as far as thresholds go, what, what's out there right now for econ economic and action thresholds? So for, for economic threshold, we're looking at 50% defoliation of the cotyledons and first true leaves. Um, uh, uh, the action threshold is, uh, is 25%. And uh, with the caveat that, the, that there are flea beetles present and they're still feeding. So uh, one of the uh, one of the, uh, uh, the features, I suppose, of, of the seed dressings or the seed treatments uh, is that these are systemic and, and they take uh, a, a bit of munching by the flea beetles for the flea beetles to actually ingest it. So there's a chance that the flea beetles could be out there, munched on the plants a little bit, you know, got a got a lethal dose of the uh, of the insecticide and, and now they're they're toast. Um, so, uh, when you're scouting, you make sure that, uh, you know, it, it isn't just damage, you see damage and active flea beetles. Uh, oftentimes the populations can be so big, they'll just, they'll just overwhelm. And if, you know, even if, even, even if they're getting killed off, you know, they show up at the plant, they munch on the plant, die, you know, if, if the numbers are high enough, then, then the damage can accumulate pretty quickly. Absolutely. And, and I mean, we wouldn't be talking entomology if we didn't talk beneficial insects. Are there anything, is there any beneficials out there that actually attack the flea beetle? Uh, there are. There is, there is a specialist parasitoid, uh, a little braconid that attacks the adults. 
Uh, it doesn't occur in numbers that are that are large enough to have a, a major influence on the population, though. Um, uh, it, it's an important consideration that that uh, neither uh, the striped nor the Christopher flea beetle are native to North America. Uh, so the striped flea beetles, I think, the first documentation is uh, in the 17th century in uh, in uh, eastern Canada or eastern U United States, and at about 1920s for for the Christopher flea beetle. So they've been uh, released from their enemies, from their from from their their native range uh, that that might normally control their populations. So uh, it's a bit of a free for all for these animals um, uh, here in North America. So there are, there are generalists that will attack them. I mean, I've I've seen a lot of you know, a lot of different animals uh, you know capture and eat uh, uh, flea beetles and you know even ladybugs. Uh, um, but uh, again, an important consideration is the numbers. Uh, so it's strictly because of the numbers of uh, flea beetles in canola fields, it's really difficult to have uh, have uh, effective control by, by natural enemies for these ones. And what sort of control methods are out there right now? Uh, there are some, uh, obviously, the seed treatments. So, I mean, we uh, uh, we have the uh, the uh, uh, the neonic-based uh, seed treatments. So we have thiamethoxam and clothionidin-based uh, seed treatments. Uh, and... Uh, 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 we still have availability of those. So uh, just a little side note, PMRA has issued a, a statement about those. We thought we were going to lose them, uh, but happily we're not. So we still have, we still have these on the market. Uh, there's a new product called Buteo Start uh, that's, uh, that uh, the data looks very interesting for, and there's some diamides. Uh, there's also a sulfoxiflor product. Uh, oftentimes these uh, will uh, get mixed up together, uh, so you get multiple modes of action affecting them. Uh, there are also uh, oversprays that are available, uh, and typically this will be done with uh, with the pyrethroid insecticide, and typically, typically you know, desis, uh, a delta methrin. Um, as far as cultural control uh, goes, uh, uh, seeding uh, uh, seeding uh, timing is important. Uh, it's a bit of a gamble, uh, of course, with early seeding, but if you can get these plants up and vigorous before the flea beetles uh, come on in, in big numbers, of course, canola is very plastic. Uh, so we can compensate for foliar feeding pretty well, but of course, with with early seeding, there's risks of frost. There's you know there there are some other uh, other considerations for that as well. Now, do you want to talk a bit about um, at what point they they feed on the plant uh, when they become you know like like they'll only actually be detrimental to your plant to a certain point? At what point does that canola grow through it? Yeah, by the time you get to about the four leaf stage, uh, unless the population is just crushing. Uh, the, uh, the 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 canola plants can compensate for that pretty uh, pretty well. Okay, and is there anything else you'd like to add with uh, any research out there or any management techniques you'd like to inform producers of? So yeah, the management techniques that we've talked about for for spring uh, uh, flea beetle populations or spring canola, uh, uh, I think that that pretty much covers the gamut of it. Uh, I think it's important to, to consider too is that the populations can be really localized. And uh, so for a grower or an agronomist to go out and evaluate those populations, uh, you know, check multiple sites in a field, uh, look for that 25% defoliation sample uh, uh, as a, a large number of plants. The larger number of plants in the greater area that you sample, the better idea of, of what, what's going to happen in there uh, or what's, what's happening in the field uh, can, can be appreciated. So there is, there is the opportunity to, to spot spray for these animals. You don't need to hit the whole field. They do tend to invade the invade from the field edges, so I mean that's an important consideration. Uh, uh, work that's going on right now. Uh, one thing that I'm curious about is uh, uh, the relationship between fall populations and spring populations, and it's a bit of a holy grail as far as modeling uh, and understanding what's happening with flea beetles and get a little bit of predictive power as far as what's what's happening next spring. Uh, I'm not the only one who's looking into at the into that. There there are some others as well that are that are looking into that. Uh, so University of Manitoba, University of Alberta, and uh, and Ag Canada are all examining some some you know population trends. And we trade information back and forth fairly regularly as it as it develops. Uh, one thing that came up uh, uh, back when I was a grad student, I did uh, did some work and, and found that uh, there were there were differences in the, in the, the susceptibilities of these two species to specific insecticides. And uh, it sounds like some of that work is going to continue at the University of Alberta. Uh, one thing that we don't really understand is, uh, is um, with a long exposure of these species to essentially one mode of action, uh, have they developed resistance to it? 
Uh, we haven't seen ev evidence of broad resistance, but it's it's not something that just you know it's not a switch, right? Uh, so uh, uh, the University of Alberta will be uh, will be uh, looking at uh, uh, the potential for differences in susceptibilities now versus when that initial work was done. Uh, in, well, I'm dating myself now, but almost 20 years ago. So, and, and with flea beetles, do they, as you said, like they can be localized, but do they blow with the wind too? So, if you know, like we're in the prairies, we're no stranger to some of the winds we get. Can yeah. can they blow pretty easily? The, yeah, they uh, they're they're actually excellent flyers, um, and uh, they they can travel on mass uh, in in fairly large numbers. Uh, they do seem to prefer it uh, calm. Um, so we, we did uh, did an examination uh, uh, some time ago about their about their flight heights and, and and you know how that relates to specific weather conditions and yeah if if it's real windy they they they'll tend to hunker down so so their their blowing on the wind is probably less important uh, than their actual flight and uh, uh, there's evidence from Europe that they can they can travel a mile in uh, in a go uh, and of course the adults are relatively long lived so. Yeah, if they continue to fly, they have the reserves to fly, then then they're going to do it. Uh, but typically, they get around by walking or hopping. So their movement tends to be relatively slow, and that's why you see that, that invasion from the field edge. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, James. Of course.